mention the word suspicion there. Uh, one of the things that you uh, uh, document in the book is the lifelong pursuit mm. of child by intelligence agencies, mm. various intelligence agencies in Australia, in the UK, mm. in America, and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation keeps filing reports on child even after he's dead. Mm. Mm. So do you want to say something about uh, yeah. the spooks? The spooks, yes, yes. Uh, what, you, you have gone through the, the organisations that followed him and, and uh, uh, the point is that from Charles' point of view, uh, he, uh, he was aware of, of, of this and it irritated him immensely and he suffered because of it. Um, so, uh, I mean, the first instance was when he wanted to come back from Oxford to Australia, uh, while the war was still going on. Well, again, the First World War, yeah. First World War, yeah. yeah. Um, he, uh, he, 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 by this time he already had an MI5 file um, because of his anti-war activities uh, in support, in particular, of the conscientious objectors in the First World War. Um, and the MI5 wrote on, on, the, on the application for uh, uh, return to Australia not to be allowed off the ship before he reaches Australia. Poor old son wanted to get off in New York and look at museums and he wasn't allowed to. Um, he gets back to Australia and immediately uh, the military intelligence put him under surveillance. His the letters are censored. Uh, in many ways that's been a good thing for scholars like me because they're all sitting in the archives. Um, uh, he applies for jobs in Australia and the military intelligence provide information that, he's, that suggests that he's a disloyal, unworthy person. And he gets refused, uh, he gets rejected for jobs all over the place. He's, first of all, he's forced to resign from a tutorship at uh, St Andrews College in the University of Sydney. Then, although he's chosen to be uh, a, uh, an adult education lecturer at Sydney University, at the centre of the university level, he gets knocked back. Uh, he goes to Brisbane um, and uh, uh, he applies for a job for which he's eminently qualified at the University of Queensland. The University of Queensland chooses a lesser qualified person, um, saying that because Child um, had not uh, uh, fought in the war, he was uh, the kind of person who should not be allowed to, to lecture to university students. I mean, this is academic reasoning gone mad. I mean, yeah. Well, entirely politicised. Yeah, so all his life uh, he has to suffer this um, uh, surveillance. He's very annoyed about it. There's one, one, one very interesting story. He's in the Second World War. He's still, he's still being surveilled in the Second World War. And he, um, he's up in Scotland uh, in an area that the military control, because it's a very important spot to, for, for, for military uh, uh, strategic reasons, strategic reasons. Um, and uh, he's doing he's doing some, some research about the digs that, that ought to be done after the war, and he wants to send a letter, and he gets in the train and travels half a day outside of the zone so he could post a letter and not have it inspected by the military intelligence people in this area. So he's very aware and he's very annoyed about it. Um, yeah, uh, he comes back to Australia, the same sort of thing goes on. This is after 1957, after he's retired. Uh, he knows when he gets back to Australia he's going to be under surveillance again. And uh, that's, that's the way yeah, I, 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 it. I, I just want it interesting because uh, uh, sometimes in my reading of, of history, where intellectuals like Child, there's a whole pile of other intellectuals you can mention, like Russell Ward in Australia, for example, uh, the American founder of uh, uh, Occupation Health and Safety, Walter Polakoff. Uh, y y y their careers are actually screwed and, and, and stuffed up in many ways by uh, spooks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, sometimes I don't think that enough uh, 
uh, attention is actually given to this, people seem to think that spooks just operate in some sort of uh, uh, non-intrusive way, that they don't really wreck careers or wreck lives, um, but they do, mm. and they have. Yeah, yeah. And I just, you, you yeah. document that so well. And you also document, I think, beautifully the way in academia, at least, in Child's case, intelligence advice was acted upon but then disguised and given, uh, turned into other reasons. The, the, the employing authority used weasel words to explain their uh, uh, victimisation of him or something like that. Yeah. I just think that's important. That's right. Yes, yes. Um, we mentioned earlier um, Child's death, his, his death by suicide. Um, I think we should sort of talk about that. When I read a monograph in the 1960s, I think it was, uh, on Child, and it was mentioned there that, you know, I realised that he'd, he'd suicided or he might have suicided. Um, I found that hard to take. Uh, it was a, a, a famous poem circulating uh, in Sydney University by some Marty Farty person um, uh, about Ernest Hemingway. And the little poem went like this, Ernest Hemingway took the lemming way. Mm. Uh, yeah. mm. The idea was that bona fide, mm. tough, lefty intellectuals don't suicide. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But quite plainly in your book, he suicides. So yeah, let's talk yeah. about his death. Well, quite plainly, he suicides, but we know that now. At the time of his death, people didn't know it. There was a lot of speculation, but in fact, he was careful about um, the way in which the news of his death would be received, particularly by his friends. So he sent his suicide note back to uh, a colleague in Britain with... Um, uh, a note saying this is not to be opened uh, for 10 years. Uh, in, indeed, it was much longer than that before it was, was finally... When was it finally come Oh, out? sometime in the, in the 1970s, I think. Right. You know, yeah. 15, 20 years afterwards, yeah. yes. And it was published um, in Antiquity, a very famous English archaeological journal. So until that time, no one knew whether uh, he'd deliberately jumped off the cliff in the Blue Mountains at Gubbard Sleep, uh, whether it had been an accident uh, or whether perhaps he might have been pushed or uh, uh, jumped because he wanted to escape uh, some pressure from intelligence organisations, either ours or or the Russian. I mean, <laughs> really yeah, well, could you just... Yeah. Uh, I mean, your document, that was one of ASIO's last reports on him. Yes, yes, indeed. The head of ASIO was... Uh, so get the year first, 19... It's 1957. Yep. Uh, and his death has just been announced. Um, and the head of ASIO writes to the New South East in Canberra, writes to the New South Wales uh, branch manager saying, OK, let's investigate the counter espionage aspects of this, and he calls it a suicide. Now, <laughs> I mean, until that point, it might have been an accident. Right? And indeed, when the coroner reported, the coroner said, uh, uh, fell, to, uh, fell to his death, reasons unknown. Hmm? So the whole question was, was in, in the minds of the, of the general public and even of uh, friends and colleagues, you know, up in the air. Uh, but Asia thought, no, no, uh, this is a man who's had a long history of being associated with subversive people on the left. Uh, uh, there may well have been uh, some counter-espionage aspect of it. Well, what that would mean, I can't imagine. Perhaps that, perhaps that the Soviets would, thought that they should get rid of him in case, he's, in, in case he had some moment of, uh, of recanting just before he, you know, at his old age and, and spilled the beans to, to ASIO about his role in, in, in spying and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and interestingly enough, um, about 10 years after he died, there was a book published, a novel in England by a woman, uh, and it was about uh, a, an aged archaeologist who was wandering around the Western Isles of Britain, uh, the New Hebrides, Ireland, the Scillies and so on, um, uh, 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 helping the Soviets install special devices to guide their rockets into British targets. Right. Right? And the climax of the story comes when the old professor, who has been blackmailed into doing this because he once had an affair with a Russian's wife or something like that, some impossible story, um, he realises, the, the old, old professor realises that he's uh, 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 going to be questioned by some MI5 people who are following him around. Right. No. These, are the, these are the real heroes of the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a guy and his girlfriend. And so to escape them, he runs along a cliff and he slips and he falls off. Okay. Right. So, yeah. And then the Russian guy from the boat comes up and shoots him and makes certain he's dead. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Now, why would a woman 10 years after child's death write a book like that? very obviously based on child. And I say very obviously because everyone knew that the author in fact knew child right. because he'd written an earlier novel dedicated to him. Okay, yes. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so why did she write this kind of novel? Which clearly suggested that child was a, a, an agent of, yeah. of the Soviet Union or you know, playing some role in their espionage activities. And you might clear in the yeah. The reason was that she was in fact not Anne Bridge, she was Lady O'Malley and she was married to a very right-wing British diplomat. Right. And <coughs> he knew, because he's in the Foreign Office, uh, that George Orwell had fingered Child as a famous subversive, someone not to be trusted. Right, right. Okay. Yep. So I think in her mind, when the story of his death uh, and when she suddenly, when, when she learned about the Orwell's uh, view and when she learned about her husband's suspicions of this man, uh, she, 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 she could, she decided that in fact the child was a very uh, uh, suspicious, suspicious person. person. Yes. Uh, uh, I think we should make clear now too that uh, uh, in your study of child. Uh, he actually does go to the Soviet Union and he's, he's, got, do, yeah. he's got contacts there. Yeah, yeah. But you point out his, his reservations about what he's seen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he went to the Soviet Union three or four times uh, from the 30s to 1956. By 1956, he's uh, disillusioned uh, with the Stalinist regime. Now, I should point out that he, uh, as early as the 30s, he regarded uh, uh, the Russian Soviet regime uh, as totalitarian. I mean, it's not as if this is a late right, uh, development. Uh, no. development. No. Um, but by 1956, after the um, uh, Hungarian, after the invasion of Hungary by Soviet forces, and, uh, and after Khrushchev's famous uh, speech in 1956 revealing that, uh, that Stalin had been a monster, then uh, you know, he, he was able to, uh, to, you know, to be much more open about it. Um, his, um, his dislike of the Soviet regime. But while he disliked the Soviet regime, he still believed that, um, that, a, uh, that socialism needed a, a, a revolutionary moment to be introduced. And so he always believed that, the, that what happened in 1917 uh, in Russia and, 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 and what happened later in the 40s in China uh, and elsewhere were um, uh, uh, historical developments of the most importance. The, they, they showed the possible uh, way in which uh, socialism could be created through um, a mass popular uprising. Uh, and he, he, his whole approach to history ever since, the early, ever since he, he came across Marxism was in, 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 the, in, in the First World War uh, was to believe that, um, that that history was a story of, 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 of revolutions at various times. And of course, he's, in archaeology, he's best known for his thesis of the two revolutions, uh, 
the agricultural revolution and, and then the, the urban revolution. So, <clears throat> like many intellectuals at that time who were socialists, the idea of revolution had, had an, an immense appeal, romantic, creative, it was, it was seen as a sort of creative moment of popular control, um, you know, restoring democracy to, to, to ordinary people. Right, well, that brings us to another uh, interesting thing. I think it should, you know, what's clear in the book is that uh, child, uh, uh, and you argue and develop the theme that what you, that materialism and his understanding of materialism is uh, central to his whole life, right? Mm -hmm. But he, he, he discovers Marx before the Russian Revolution. He discovers it in Australia, I think, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, could you sort of talk a little bit about that? Because... Uh, mm -hmm. um, yes, I think that's important. Well, uh, I think it's one of the most important things in the, in the book, that his understanding of Marxism is what unifies all of his works. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about Marxism here, uh, like, uh, it's not Marxism of a dogmatic kind. It's hard to pigeonhole. Mm. He, 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 you've got him at okay. one stage, I, you remember the exact oh. quote, for example, where he says, basically he says that, uh, Stalinists basically won't understand my Marxism, but the old man, Marx, would. Yeah, OK. So, to go back a bit, um, he, um, he's first taught Marxism at the University of Sydney uh, in the lectures by his philosophy professor, um, Francis Anderson. And at that stage, Marxism for him is a, a so kind of sociology. Put that down, don't give it a date, roughly. Oh, that's about, that's, that, that's 19... 17. Right. Oh, no, hang on. Sorry. No. Sorry, 1930. 1930. Before, before I leave the university. It's, it's yes. Okay. So then he goes to Oxford um, and he gets caught up in socialist politics uh, in Britain. And um, in particular, he meets uh, a, a man called Rajani Palm Dutt, um, who introduces him to Marxism as a theory of revolutionary change. I think that's the moment when he begins to think about the significance of revolutions in history. Um, now, he goes back to Australia and there's another a moment when we get a very important insight into what he thinks of Marxism. Uh, he ends up in Brisbane looking for a job. Uh, some of his friends in the labour movement get him a, a position as an adult education tutor in economics. <laughs> at the University of Queensland. And so what does he do? He takes his class through Marx's capital, but from the point of view of Benedetto Croce. <laughs> now, the significance of this is that Croce was an Italian idealist philosophy, philosopher uh, in the early 20th century. And um, Croce's approach to Marx uh, was quite different to the sort of scientistic Marxism that was developing through the, um, uh, the, the orthodox socialist movement, the German Social Democratic parties and the other Social Democratic parties uh, uh, throughout Europe. Um, they tried to make Marxism into a science of universal laws, uh, certain stages that had to be gone through in history before socialism could occur and so on and so forth. But what Croce found in Marx is what the so-called Western Marxists like Lukács and, uh, and, and, and Korsch and others have discovered in Marx, a, a creative, uh, a, view of a, Marx, a, a view of Marxism as a way to creatively understand the world um, uh, by, by interacting with it, by applying knowledge to social conditions and seeing how change occurs as a result of that. It's not. It's it's a question of um, uh, being realistic, of regarding history as something real, uh, rather than something which can be abstracted into a series of universal laws. Now, 
happened in the Soviet Union after 1917 was that Stalin took up that um, uh, 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 scientistic approach to Marxism, codified it into a, a theory of, of um, uh, uh, Marxism-Leninism, um, and it became the, the it, it provided a whole set of dogmatic statements that could be turned turned out by the communist parties throughout the world and called Marxism. Charles thought this was ridiculous. He didn't have a he didn't, he, didn't, he, he, he didn't support that approach to Marxism. And there's a famous discussion that's in the book between him and Palm Dart on exactly this point. He says, he says, I'm not going to use that language because I don't believe that this is what Marxism is. Um, so he's in a quite different tradition of Marxism. Now, the significance of this for archaeology is that um, that kind of Western Marxist tradition was not really understood in... in, in in intellectual circles until uh, much later, the 1960s and 70s, after Child died. So, he, so it was it was very difficult for people to see him in that in in, in this in this in the way in this way as being a sort of Hegelian Marxist. Um, now, the archaeologists always knew that there was something a little bit kind of Marxist about him. The question was for them. Uh, when did he become a Marxist? In, and what is the what is the first sign in, in his archaeological writings of his Marxism? And they looked in vain because he never he never used that that jargon from the Soviet Union. So they could never work it out. And there was never really a beginning there because the beginning was much earlier. Of course, of course, yes.